All right, we're recording. Um, okay, good afternoon. It is January 24th, and this is the Finance Committee meeting. And uh, I am temporarily chairing it because each year, as the um, committees are um, appointed, which they that happened last week, uh, we reorganize and we elect a chair and a vice chair. So on November uh, 7th, um, the legislature uh, extended the open meeting law that allows us to meet virtually. Uh, this meeting is accessible by Zoom, by phone, or Amherst, Amherst Media. I'm going to go ahead and call on the members of the committee um, and make sure they can hear us and we can hear them. I'm going to start with Anna Devon Gothier. Hi, everybody. I can hear you. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is present. Uh, Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. And our non-voting non residents, but highly valuable members. Uh, Bob Hegner. I'm here. Bernie Kubiak. Present. Matt Holloway. Present. Okay. And I just want to make sure, David, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Sonia? Yes. And Holly? Yes, I'm here. Okay. So with that, uh, I'm going to open the floor for nominations for chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, you can nominate yourself, you can volunteer yourself, you can be nominated by someone else. Um, and if nobody puts their hand up, I'm going to just do it. No, nobody put their hand up. All right. Um, I nominate Andy Steinberg. Oops. We have an attendee who is in. Ah, Alicia Walker needs to be brought in before we start. Hi, good morning. Hi, Alicia. Can you hear us? Yes, yeah, thank you, Lynn. Okay. And so, uh, Alicia, the floor is now open for nominations for chair of the Finance Committee, and then we'll move on to vice chair, and then I will turn the meeting over to the chair. Um, so I'm the floor is open for nominations for the chair of the Finance Committee. We take all volunteers and all nominations. And since I'm not seeing any hands, I'm going to nominate Andy Steinberg. Shane seconds. Actually, it doesn't even need a second, but that's great. Andy. Okay. <laughs> uh, Andy, do you accept the nomination? I will accept the nomination, yes. Okay. Are there any other people who would like to nominate or would like to serve as chair of finance? Seeing no hands, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion that Andy Steinberg be elected as chair of finance. And that has been seconded. Um, Kathy, second? Yes. Okay, so we're going to take a roll call vote. We'll start with Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Um, let's see, Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Uh, Kat, uh, Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? I will uh, vote yes. Okay. Alicia Walker? Yeah. And I'm going to ask our uh, resident members if they uh, want to concur, and that's Bob Hegner. Concur. Bernie Kubiak? With great enthusiasm, I concur. <laughs> and Matt Holloway? With all the enthusiasm I can muster, I concur. <laughs> oh, no. It's, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we're now going to go on to nominations for vice chair. Uh, again, the floor is open for volunteers, for people to be nominated, and I'm waiting for hands. And if people aren't going to do it, then I'll just do it myself since I'm a member of the committee. Um, Lynn, can I just say something first? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm willing to continue. I have been vice chair, but I also... I'm wondering whether any of the resident members might like to be vice chair because I double checked with Andy. I don't think there's anything in our rules what that would prohibit that. 
So since we in the past have always done counselors, I just wanted to see if anyone might be interested. I have been vice chair for the whole time. Four years. Four years. Right. Oh, who's counting? Um, okay. It's open for the resident members. They're all <laughs> jumping up and down. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'm nominate Kathy Shane. That does not require a second. Are there any other nominations? Then seeing none, Kathy, do you accept the nomination? Yes, I do. Okay. Then we're going to, uh, I'm going to make a motion that Kathy Shane be vice chair of finance. Uh, and we're going to start with Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Oh. Oh. Uh, Anna, how about seconding that motion first? I thought you said it didn't need a second. Okay, sure. No, that one needs a second. Second. <laughs> okay. And then Anna. Aye. Uh, okay. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Uh, Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Bob Hegner. I concur. Bernie Kubiak. Again, with great enthusiasm, I concur. And Matt, and Matt Holloway. I concur. Okay. Uh, I'm done. Andy, it's your meeting. Well, thank you. And uh, I've been uh, as chair as long as uh, Kathy's been vice chair. We've been a, a team and we'll try to continue to be. Um, I want to find, um, ask since the third item on the agenda is public comment, whether there are any members of the public who wish to make a comment um, on any matter that is relevant to the Finance Committee. It does not have to pertain to today's agenda. And so I'll give a pause to see if uh, any members of the public wish to make comment. Okay. Seeing that, I um, then we'll go on to the next item. Did we were um, I checked the packet earlier and I did not see the budget reports, Sean. Or... Yeah, so I, I added it um, about an hour ago. There's some miscommunication. I thought um, it had already been added. So the the two first uh, the first quarter and second quarter reports have been added, and so has the um, the real proper uh, surplus real property policy. Um, so they're in the packet now. Apologize for the um, miscommunication. Uh, so I'll ask members of the committee, do, uh, does anyone um, want to ask for a couple of minutes for them to download and we take a pause in the meeting or shall we just turn it over to Sonia and ask her to make a presentation and come back? Um, so actually Holly is going to give the presentation today. Um, we're, we're at a rare time where we're fortunate to have two comptrollers. Uh, so, um, so uh, Sonia helped uh, prepare the report, but Holly is going to go through it and um, explain it to the committee tenor. Would it be helpful to take them for anybody to take a minute pause uh, to, to get to the packet? And Since we were also going to put it up on the screen and um, okay. if, that, if that's helpful. This is our request, Ron, and we, uh, and Holly, hi. So I'm Holly Drake. Um, I'm excited to present my first quarterly report as comptroller. Um, as you, you all know, Sonia, as um, our longtime comptroller is retiring in the near future and we're in the um, transition stage uh, to myself, um, I've been working for the town for 24 years. The last 19 years, I've been uh, assistant comptroller with Sonia and I'm excited for a, for a new chapter here. So um, on the report here, uh, both the first quarter and the second quarter reports are available on the accounting department's uh, page of the website and all of the details uh, can be accessed there. I'm just gonna give a sort of brief overview of some of the highlights, some of the things that are um, well beyond the 50% uh, benchmark that you would expect us to be at halfway through the fiscal year. Um, you know, this is the second quarter. We're at the halfway point of FY23. 
Uh, although many um, departments are starting to feel some of the stresses of rising costs of utilities and fuel and other commodities, um, most of the variances are due to timing issues. Um, but we will be monitoring budgets very closely over the next few months as things are, you know, beginning to get tight. Um, we'll have a better idea when the third quarter report is complete as to where we um, are projecting will fall at the end of FY23. So on the revenue side, I'm just gonna point out a couple of things, um, things like transfers in and pilot payments, payments in lieu of taxes. Um, they were posted at the beginning of the fiscal year. So they're already at 100% or close to it. Um, investment income is slightly elevated right now uh, due to the fact that we need to wait for all of our December bank statements to come in before I can allocate out interest to the other funds, such as the enterprise funds. Um, although I do expect this to be well over our budgeted revenues this year, um, if the investment rates continue to climb, as we've seen in the first half of this fiscal year, our interest rates um, on investments are much higher than they have been in the last couple of fiscal years. Um, motor vehicle excise taxes will seem extremely low at this time, but that's just a timing issue as the collector's office issuing out the um, motor vehicle excise tax bills at the end of February or early March, and that's the normal time frame, and then a large amount of that revenue will come in before the end of the fiscal year. So on the enterprise revenue side, they're all hovering right around the 50% mark, um, with the exception of the solid waste fund. Um, the difference in the solid waste fund is that we did increase the price of the um, landfill stickers this year. And it, it also is a timing issue as those um, landfill stickers expire July 1st of every year. So we tend to sell the majority of them in July, August, and September early in the fiscal year. Um, and then they sort of trail off for the remainder of the fiscal year. And, you know, timing wise, those will catch up. Um, and then on the um, expense side, you'll see um, a few of the higher percentages are mostly due to timing issues, again, um, such as the um, miscellaneous and insurance uh, category. Uh, we pay our full insurance bill for the year at the beginning of the fiscal year, and then we need to allocate those costs out to the schools, the library, and the enterprise funds. I'm in the process of completing that right now, so we should be back to normal percentages for the next report. Um, snow and ice typically shows us overspent at this time of year, but that is due to um, large encumbrances when we go out to contract for our prices on snow and ice chemicals, sand and salt, we'll put in a placeholder for the entire fiscal year, but then we'll adjust it to just our actual expenses and our actual deliveries at the end of the snow season. Um, same thing with debt, you will see that debt is actually one of our lowest percentages right now. And that's just due to the timing of debt payments. Um, debt payments are typically in the spring. I believe they're um, mostly in April and June, I believe. And then those payments will catch up and get um, more to, towards a normal uh, trend. And then the enterprise fund expenditures, they're all over the 50% mark right now, but many of those are also due to encumbrances that we'll put in for the entire year and then we'll balance out at year end. And we are we are closely monitoring the enterprise funds as costs are rising. Um, it is a bit concerning, but we will have a better picture again at the end of the third quarter um, and a better idea if the consumption is um, going to uh, rebound. Uh, for the water and then the related sewer charges. Um, you know, we may need to make some adjustments there or ask for a supplemental appropriation. Um, the enterprise funds are still struggling a bit. Um, and then there is also a chart of at the end that shows um, the revenues for the past several fiscal years at this same time frame, just to see um, you know, where we are on track with, with prior years, remembering that 2021 and, um, you know, a portion of 2022, we were affected by the pandemic, but things are, um, we are seeing things bounce back in most areas, um, back to where we would expect them to be. So there's not a lot of concern, um, really on the, on the revenue side. 
So um, I'm going to just leave it there, leave it brief. Um, you know, again, these reports are available on the website and, you know, we are happy to answer any questions that you have and specific to the report um, or at a subsequent meeting once folks get a chance to read more closely through it. Andy, do you want me to just keep slowly scrolling through it in case I? Yeah, okay. yeah I was going to go to questions in a okay. second. So this report, um, just I think Holly explained it, but this is one that Sonia added a um, couple of years ago. That's very interesting. It shows through this point in the year how revenues are doing. Um, so compared to prior years. This one's a good one to focus on too. This other exercise, these are a couple of our big economic indicators, the hotel, motel, and the tax. Let's see, for the most part, they're getting back to pre-pandemic levels. Of cannabis. Yeah, cannabis is the one that the trend is, for, um, it, it doesn't seem to be just Amherst. I've heard from some other um, an outside group that cannabis sales or recreational cannabis sales are trending down. Um, and they're trying to figure out what's causing it. And we're, we are seeing that here too. Hampton had too many dispensaries. Yeah, that, and I've heard when, when the law passes, it's common for there to be a, you know, sales to be maybe elevated for the first couple of years, once the law, um, once it's legal, and then for it to start to dwindle a little bit from there. So the enterprise funds. The ironic thing is that the solid waste fund is probably the one that's doing the best, <laughs> which has not been the case for many, many years. Case, that's right. And that's continued on until this year. Huh? Yeah, especially now too with the solar array, um, that's going to bring in some more revenue for them. So. Okay, so um, I'll do questions uh, just in order of how to. Bob Hegner, we'll start. With yeah, that. I just, um, you know, we raised the parking fees um, starting this year. I'm wondering where we are with parking fees. I maybe you scroll past it quickly, Sean. Yeah. Um, that last page, Sean. Yeah, let me show you. They are up, which is good. We haven't seen a full year yet, but it is higher. So if you look at um, the parking permits right here, the section, yeah. you can see what we've brought in mm -hmm. so far through the first six months. And so, you know, 
for this town center resident, we were bringing in five, six thousand um, dollars. This year we've brought in 43 so far. Sure. Um, so that uh, we we were a little concerned. Would we see a drop off in the number of purchase? It's a little bit lower than what we were expecting, but it's not. Uh, but you can see the revenue is still clearly there. Great. Thanks. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, two questions. One is it, regarding investments. Is it because bond rates are higher right now and that's generally where we invest? Yeah, so there's there's sort of two sides to the investment income. So the investment income you saw in this chart is what we earn on um, bank accounts and CDs and things like that, sort of right. current current year revenue. Those things have all gone up, as, as like you said, as right. the Fed has raised rates. Uh, I think we had a, we're looking at CDs in the four or 5% range, which we haven't done that. And I don't think since I've been here um, with the town in general. So those rates are really good. Um, the investments that are actually invested in the stock market, those not so good. Obviously 2022, I think I've heard was the worst, the third worst year on record in terms of uh, performance in the, uh, for those, uh, for funds that are invested. So where you'll see that at some point is we will have, if there's, if we have a net overall loss, it'll get posted to our funds as a, a unrealized loss potentially in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's something you'd look to see at the end of the fiscal year. Um, so you'll see, I haven't looked at the, I'll have to look at it closer to see if the number was for FY22, because um, we'll have the FY22 audit for you, ready for you guys to look at pretty soon. Um, but you, where you'll probably see it is FY23. Um, you might see a, a market correction because of what happened in the stock market. And that'll, uh, so the treasurer ultimately is responsible, but we work with, um, depending on the different pot of money, we have different uh, advisors. So our OPEB funds are invested with the state, with um, uh, PRIM and with uh, through PARAC. And our um, general reserves, we have an investment advisor, Abby Capital, who uh, helps us. Uh, implement our investment policy and make sure the funds are invested in accordance with that investment policy. So my second question, I actually have a question. Um, my second question is, if we were to do a supplemental, would that come out of operating reserves? Uh, in the enterprise funds? Yeah. Yeah, it would come out of retained earnings if we were to... Um, do a supplemental appropriation this year. We're hoping to not have to do it. We're hoping to find ways to get by this year without it. Um, but if we are, if we're in a position where we have to come out of retained earnings. But I also assume we might have to do a supplemental just because of rising costs for department expenses. Um, so we we already did that already. Um, right. So we're we're hoping the general fund budget will be in good shape. But we haven't. We're not seeing any general fund budgets that are in the same shape as the, uh, the sewer fund for the enterprise fund. So yeah, if you remember, we did do that extra half per percent um, a few months ago. Okay. Uh, and then my final question, um, I'm just watching the federal scene and reading um, the very excellent comments from our Senator, I mean, from our Congressman, uh, are we, you know, I assume that like everybody else, if the government defaults, we could be in some serious trouble. Yeah, um, the direct impacts on us. I'm not. I'm not. Um, I don't have any quantifiable direct impacts on us. I'm sure there will be ripple effects that will uh, will, especially as we go out. We're looking at these four building projects, and we go out. Um, if there's some sort of default that affects the market and creates uh, turmoil there. Um, that could certainly have ne negative impacts on the town. Yeah. yeah, it's a to be seen, to be watched. Thank yeah. you. And Holly, I just want to say congratulations and thank you for your first report. Thank you, Lynn. Happy. So I have, um, having looked at these reports <laughs> all these years, I have just a notational question first. When we first see revenues, they're all in parentheses and I, I'm always used to seeing as a paren as a negative. And then when we see revenues later, the parentheses are removed. So that summary table, is there a reason 
we do that. And I was actually asked by another counselor, she thought those were negatives. And I said, no, those are revenues, those are positives. Um, so I just have a question of why we, and that's on that very first table, um, estimated revenues, actual yeah. revenues. So just a, why that, why that is the way we show it up. So our accounting system shows revenues as negatives. Um, revenues is revenues are technically credits in accounting, and so our accounting system shows them as credits. So a lot of the reports that we generate, we pull straight from our accounting system, um, and rather than having to, you know, create some sort of other report that converts all all of them, we just keep it. Okay, the way it comes I, I figured it was some. So it just um, I that was kind of the answer I gave without knowing why. Um, <laughs> So Bob asked my question about revenues from the permits. Um, I'm also wondering whether on excise taxes, I know we don't um, do those until February-ish, but I'm wondering if you're going to be able to see whether there was a shift because it's if you are getting a resident permit and didn't have your car registered here and you moved it over, will you be able to see that potentially third quarter? And then and you know as a bump up we be able to distinguish i mean revenues are from excise yeah. taxes yeah um that's a good question i know we've we have continued to sort of make people aware of it when they come to uh pay for their permits um i think we've heard of a couple of cases where at least that we know of where they have uh looked into switching it um we can all we can certainly look at the number of uh excise tax bills that are Generated, okay. but I'm not sure if that will, you know, I'm not sure if that'll be a one to one that this led that, to. That that's many. okay. Just, you know, we, that sits there and people may not realize it. And then my last one is I looked at revenues mm -hmm. when you were flashing, Bob. I also downloaded it um, from our parking meters. We're not yet back up to 2020. So it looks, mm -hmm. like, you know, if you use that as another indicator of downtown activity, mm -hmm. you know, they're coming down to see a movie and I, I see it in Amherst Cinema. The, the the movies just don't begin to have the number of people, uh, you know, and they were all generating fees, you know, on parking meters. So um, I, I'll be interested to see what third quarter brings as some of the restaurants that were closed start opening again. Um, we had, so that's, that's to me a good, it's not a lot of money, but it's a good economic indicator of um, getting back to whatever the new normal is. Yeah, no, that is something we're, we're watching closely. Kathy, to your first question, one thing I, I'll check with our um, treasurer collector, we also gave people the option that if they uh, paid the full permit fee and then they changed the registration throughout the year, we could we would um, make the adjustment for them. So I can see at the end of the year, how many of those she's aware of where we had to go in and adjust it. Um, that might be one way to get a count. No, it's not, it's not a big issue. We just were looking, we, we were- Yeah, see if it's, see if that policy the is. Impact might be. Yep. So thank you. Andy, did you say me? Sorry. Yes, I did. Um, thank you. Okay, so I only have two post-its worth, which is really exciting. Um, first one to follow that trend that Kathy brought up why, so I'm looking at the, I'm just gonna look at the meter credit card revenues for now. Why is the 2023 budget so high? And I don't say that, I'm not trying to sound snarky about it. Um, it's higher even than the, the 2020 actuals. So is that, how do, you, how do you determine that? I think it's 110. How do you determine that number? And what, what is supposed to get us to that point? Is it just growth and, and expected growth in parking? So that, um, so are you looking at where it's uh, uh, 87, 23, 56, yep. that one? Yeah. Um, so those first four numbers, those are only receipts through um, December 30th, uh, 31st. The 110 is the full year budget. So you can see how it's doing relative to the full year. Got it, thank you. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Um, yeah, I should have explained that better. When no, 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 it. you're fine. But what you do see in that is that we're not back to FY20 when 20, it comes to, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool, thank you so much. A um, Couple of really small things, uh, <laughs> excuse me. The next page, the parking violation since 2007, that's like 60 bucks a year, 45 bucks a year. Is that just overdue, like people like me who forget that they have a parking ticket? From yes, yeah, so it's when, uh, when something gets paid that was committed back then, it will we'll post it to the year that it was technically recorded, yeah. And then the late fee goes to a different, 
that's why those are so low because i would assume yeah that okay yeah. um one really small thing uh it still says lord jeff parking fees on page 14 and that if we could switch that that'd be that'd be great just in the name in the budget i don't know if that's possible yeah holly um, can you can you make a note to update that account name and munis yeah absolutely Thank um you. okay Almost done, I promise. I'm sorry, I'm trying to try to go fast. What is a cell tower rental? And I didn't mark the page. Um, what is that on? Or For solid waste. Solid waste. Yeah, what is that? So um, uh, we have uh, space at the landfill and at Ruxton where um, uh, communication companies have rented land to put a cell tower up. Um, or at least plan to put a cell tower up and, and in exchange for that, they make a payment to the town each year. And then in addition, uh, they rent the communication companies, they rent space on that tower to other um, other companies. And then we also get a percentage of the revenue that they collect on this. Thank you. Thank you for everyone's patience in my learning. Um, last, last three here. So I um, already talked about parking. The, there are some things that have been listed under non-recurring, reoccurring uh, revenues that definitely seem to be reoccurring. And I know that that probably just means we can't necessarily expect them, but um, I'm just curious about if we could just talk, so now I lost it, sorry. Um, do, do, do. Those go to, I believe, free cash, right? So, oh, okay, so it's, yeah, okay, thank you, Holly. So um, homeless transportation, and then I don't know what the HM occupancy fees are. Uh, if you could just explain both of those. So um, homeless transportation too? Uh, sure, yeah. Is that the, okay. Um, so homeless transportation is um, the uh, children who um, are at a homeless shelter or in foster care, the town will get, uh, the state reimburses a portion of the transportation costs to get them to school. Great. Okay, so, thank you. Okay. So that's that one. That, and then, sorry, go ahead, Paul. That's the McKinney Vento Act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And they, I just and made I that reference recently. The governor pledged full funding of that at, at the MMA annual meeting. That would be the reference that I heard. <laughs> and then um, UMass, so that, those are the, um, the uh, UMass has agreed to give us a occupancy fee um, for revenue generated at the, the hotel on campus. Um, for non UMass accounts, awesome. so um, you're probably you're probably right that some of these, you know, the miscellaneous non recurring sounds like it doesn't happen every year. Some of these, they're they're not technically set in stone, but they are at this point they become sort of recurring. <clears throat> so um, you know, we could take a look at these and and see if uh, they I should don't... shift to another category. But generally, that's they kind of they got there because they were sort of things that were set in stone, like the opioid settlement. That's a new one. Right. That's a that's a good example of one that we're going to get every year for the next 22, 23 years, but yeah. then it'll go away completely. Um, so that makes but, sense. But that's how they've gotten there. Okay, last question, I promise. Um, you had mentioned, Holly, in the very beginning, I think something about rentals fluctuating. Um, <clears throat> and is that just timeline of rental registration fees oh, being due? Gosh. Or why why would rental income from um, I'm assuming it's registrations, why would that fluctuate? <laughs> Um, I, I don't remember mentioning um, oh, the sorry. rental Maybe income totally specifically, but um, that is, uh, those are not rental registration, correct? Those are rentals for um, properties that we lease oh, okay. out to other agencies. Then I get it. Right. That makes yeah. more sense. Then. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right. And during, during the pandemic, we had a couple um uh, renters leave, they, they yeah. went somewhere else. Yeah, like their brothers and sisters. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Bernie? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Edie. An, an observation. Um, uh, car sales for 2022 were off, new car sales were off by at least 8%, <clears throat> which made it the worst year in 11 years. So. Uh, I think we should be watching uh, auto excise very carefully. In addition, people have been holding out of their cars. So we're um, typical car has now on, been on the road for like 10 years, which means the excise on that is minimal. So I think we have to watch that uh, very carefully. I wanna uh, thank Holly for her presentation and offer um, all kinds of gratitude to Sonia 
for the work she's done. And uh, uh, it's uh, it's a crazy making position, as Holly will find out. Uh, <laughs> it's not just been able to handle it. And I, uh, um, I, I think we uh, really need to recognize the value that uh, folks uh, like her uh, bring to the town and to the town taxpayers. So thank you, son. Thank you. And I concur totally, as I'm sure the entire committee does. And uh, welcome, Holly, and appreciate what you did. Uh, one thing that came up last night was a, a question that I, so I can re ask uh, the, on behalf of the council in general, uh, because the subject came up of the D Disability Access Advisory Board wanting to become a commission and that they would uh, be entitled then to the parking tickets for uh, handicapped parking space violations. Is that tracked? Do we track that particular violation? And We don't track it as a separate uh, revenue account, I don't believe, um, but I have asked our collector to pull some numbers. They can, they can go into the the details of the violations to find some uh, prior years and how much was collected in those years um, so that we have a sense of it. And so they, so that's something they are actively doing now. But you don't have a number you want to put out yet? I've seen, uh, I've asked them to go a little bit farther back. I've seen um, 2022, which was a pretty small number, um, but I, we weren't sure if that was indicative of what it was like before the pandemic. So, so I've asked them to go back. Um, it's not in the tens of thousands of dollars. It's it's a relatively small number, but um, whether it's hundreds or thousands, I'm still trying to get a couple of years worth of data to uh, give Paul an estimate. Okay, no, that, that's helpful to know, thank you. Um, I guess it, it's just a broad question. Uh, is any of you, um, and this goes to Sonia Holly and John, uh, as you look at lines, are there particular lines that you're watching closely right now because of concerns or indications of um, what they might mean? Well, Holly, you can go first. I think, <laughs> I think in particular, we'd be looking at um, the utility lines, um, heating oil, um, gas, uh, propane, uh, electricity, um, fuel, uh, gasoline and diesel. Those are the ones that we're paying particular attention to right now. Um, the, the utilities are, especially with the price of uh, electricity going up, um, January 1st was a big rate increase. And so we're gonna have to pay particular attention to those. Yeah, I think, uh, Sonia, do you wanna go? You wanna... I don't know, Andy, did you mean on the revenue side? Either side, actually, yeah, uh, because uh, we'd seen that there would be some lines on both. That in, a, but the the fuel question makes absolute sense. Mm -hmm. Well, on the revenue side, our revenue seems to be doing better, but that's because we're recovering from the pandemic, <laughs> so it's kind of hard to tell. We are we always do watch the economic growth revenues, like. Uh, building permits and uh, motor vehicle excise to see if they start dropping, then we know that's an indication from, from the economy going down or up. But um, we look at these pretty much once a month to see what's coming in. And we take note, that's why we do the quarterly report so we can report back to the council and the management on where we're at with revenues. And if we see any issues that might come up Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else in the way of questions from the committee? Uh, Anna. It's not a question. I just, this report is so, despite my 20,000 questions, so clear and um, really helpful in explaining why things are where they are. So thank you very, very much. Okay. And, and as you go through, spend time going through the report, and if there are additional questions, uh, 
No, don't hesitate to bring them forward to, you know, maybe just do it as an email to Sean. Is that the best way? So don't leave, don't have to leave them hanging because especially since we uh, haven't had much time to go through them in advance. And uh, so uh, uh, just for all committee members to know that if you have questions, don't hesitate to bring them forward. And if they're of interest to the entire committee, we'll try and find a space to get them reported back. So having said that, I don't know that we have anything else to do on the quarterly reports. I don't see any other, any other hands up. And uh, so, Sonia, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for all of the prior years. And um, we um, gonna miss you, but and wish you well. Thank you. Whatever you're going next. And um, Holly, uh, you know, you've been uh, working with Sonia a long time and um, we welcome you into your new role and uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Yeah. You've got another five weeks of Sonia, so. <laughs> She's not going anywhere fast, don't worry. She'll be here helping me for a bit. <laughs> no, don't make me cry. It's not a, it's not a hard stop either. It's a, you know, it'll, it'll be a gradual process. Yeah. So, Sonia probably, needs that as much as we do. She needs a gradual. This is the last quarterly report. Mm -hmm. we Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. You never know. <laughs> I don't mind helping out with the reports. It might be my last meetings. <laughs> that would be awful. Are you going to be uh, with us on the audit this year? Uh, sure. Since it was my year, 2022. So, um, I don't know if you're staying with me, you and Holly are staying with the meeting, but uh, I gather our uh, firm now has a new name, but uh, we still- Yeah, I don't know it off the top of my head. It's too new. Mark, Markham. Uh, Markham, yeah. Uh, do we have an idea as to when they're going to be back to the committee? Well- we're promised the report by the end of January. They've had yeah, we there are there are some weights that, that are out of our control. Like we had to wait for Hampshire County Retirement to finish their financial statements. We had to wait for the OPEB report. And there's a few missing items that we're still gathering. And as soon as we have that, they're they're pretty close though. So by the end of this, by the end of this week, maybe, maybe next week. We'll have a, a draft at least that I need to review and then get back to them on. So okay. yes. So probably the probably later in February, Andy, we would look to um whenever we have finance committee around that time, um, have the audit committee. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lynn, do you have something? You're muted. Similar, similarly, um I am uh getting the message that. CPA will probably come to the council on the 6th of February, which if anybody on the finance committee can just help me remember, I don't think we did a big presentation at the council. I think we waited and we did it at the finance committee last year, mm -hmm. and that seemed to work pretty well. And then we brought it back to the council. So Andy, uh, in addition to the sixth being uh, a meeting where we'll get the referral for CPA. Uh, we will also start getting referrals related to the school financing as well. Yeah, I have the schedule from uh, the slide from last night. Yeah. yeah, and I just confirmed it for Paul that that was the slide that Sean developed uh, back in December, I think. So. Okay, so CPA sure. will come to finance um, on for February 7th. And we need to decide whether we want to do a presentation, uh, whether we want CPA to do a presentation then. And then in addition to that, we're saying the audit probably will come to us, what, the end of February, beginning of March? Okay. Definitely, yeah. And I believe that's an automatic referral. Yeah. That's it. 
Holly, have you been staffed to the committee this year, CPA? Um, I, I've been backing Sonia up. She's done most of the meetings, but I've been trying to stay in, in touch with it. Okay. So I didn't know who. Kathy, you have a question. Uh, it's just a question on February 20, on February 7th is a pretty packed agenda. And I'm wondering whether we should tentatively post, uh, think of meeting the following Tuesday if we don't get through it. So I'm, there are, there's a lot of things to discuss on the school. Um, so Andy, I, we usually are just meet. And I don't know whether that's the vacation week. So I didn't look at my calendar right now, but I'm just, the basic point is we might not, we might need to meet more often because of some discussions we need to have. I agree with that. Yeah, um, we are jumping a little bit ahead because we're kind of jumping into uh, uh, item number six on the agenda. No, it's it's okay. just hearing hearing those two things. I mean, we need Sean for clearly for all of the above, and I'm not sure which part's Holly, but that that was just my comment. Hearing what's coming to us for the seventh, yeah. And I believe the school vacation week would be two weeks after that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we'll come back to the schedule and. Um, try and resolve that and if we need to get um, extra time in there cpa we, we we generally have time with we try and take it up a little bit early to get get it out of the way in advance of the rest of the budget <clears throat> but um the uh, ones that need the most attention or anything that's connected to a time specific like the school since there is a recommendation that's um, related so um, shall we go on and just stay with the agenda order so i um think it that then we're on to um discussion of uh just briefly really i think it is its first discussion of the surplus property disposition policy and uh, David was the one who uh, worked with the select board on developing that policy and has been and I gather uh, playing a key role in working with the policy I did look at it a little bit, David, and have some thoughts about it, but I don't know if you have any introductory comments you want to give. Well, yeah, thanks, Andy. I, I really didn't prepare anything, but, um, you know, I think, uh, I, I believe the date was, I think, um, 2018, was it December 2018, when it finally, I think is in March. It was a memo, and then the the policy actually kind of worked its way through the select board, um, and was was adopted by the select board. I, I think, looking at it now, I think we all agree that it probably needs some updating. Um, um, as far as I know, we really did not apply the policy to any properties to date. Um, the one property that was moving through through um, various boards and committees at the time was the East Street School property that we now know the, um, the town uh, is working closely with Wayfinders to create affordable and market rate housing at the, the two properties, one on East Street and um, one at the East Street School and one on Belchtown Road. So, um, you know, we really have not activated the policy to any great extent. I know my staff and I are um, have kind of ongoing assessments um, on properties throughout Amherst. We know that, you know, uh, we're working on a comprehensive plan for for Hickory Ridge, any of the buildable land at Hickory Ridge. We've talked in recent months uh, about that site as a likely um, and and um, very doable site for a South Amherst fire station. Um, we have. 
looked, my staff and I in the planning department have looked at the South Amherst campus um, down on the common in South Amherst. We have some property off of Strong Street that we're looking at for a possible affordable housing. We have a small piece of property on Old Farm Road that is, uh, we just got a wetlands assessment on that um, uh, is, is, you know, 70% wetlands and not buildable. Of course, the Wildwood School at some point will be um, available for other uses, uh, at least that property and or that building. And then uh, when a, a new fire station is built, we would of course have central fire. So I think the one message I wanted to get out there today is that there, uh, I think there's somewhat of, um, somewhat of a misunderstanding in some quarters that we have lots of surplus property that is unused. And um, as I look at the uh, GIS and know our, our town properties pretty well, I really don't see that there are that many properties. Um, the old Hitchcock Center building, it comes up very frequently in, in my work. And um, that building um, is owned by the town, but in fact, the land under it is conservation land. And that building, we are uh, likely moving toward a, a demolition of that building at some point. It is. Um, the we've done some building assessment of, of it and it is really in in quite terrible shape and not a good investment for the town to keep or to invest in for another entity. So um, I guess that's my quick my quick um, um, overview that I think the policy needs some updating. Um, I think we're poised to look at some of the properties we do have, but there really aren't as many properties as one might think. Um, and and as we move through the school project and and DPW and fire uh, project, there may be other properties that come to us uh, in in terms of being surplus. But right now, there aren't that many on the uh, on the list. Okay. Well, I have a preliminary observation and question, and then I want to turn it over to uh, to other members of the committee who've raised their hands. Um, <clears throat> the observation is that uh, as I looked at the policy again um, in preparation for today's meeting, it really does need updating. I thought the original, my first look at it, I said, oh, I just have to figure out where it says town meeting uh, and town manager or select board, how do, we, how do we plug in? That not only became more complicated in realizing that the select board was the executive branch and the town managers, now the executive branch. So um, that's a substitution that we need to be thinking about very carefully is um, what we're recommending on that score. The second thing that I noted is that there are statutory problems that we need to be thinking about too, because when you look at background, um, you know, the first substantive paragraph after the summary sentence, it refers to MGL chapter 40, section four, that pertains only to towns, it does not pertain to cities. So um, I think we're going to have to, uh, I started to look at it a little bit and see if I could find an equivalent uh, statutory section for cities, um, but I ran out of time. Because I was doing it in a uh, with with a very limited time availability this morning, uh, but it, I think that we are going to have to um, really look at that with care, and it may require that we ask Paul uh, to have act, uh, to refer at some point, not to not off the top, but at some point to KP Law to make sure because they probably have the experience of helping a city develop such a policy. So they may have something that can assist us in avail uh, to make, make that part of the task easier. And I guess the only question that I had, so I said an observation, a question. The question was, um, we had set up essentially, um, a committee uh, which you were going to chair today, and has the committee actually met at all, or has it not had a need to? Um, so let me just 
comment on your your first observation about the policy, and I, I completely agree, uh, Andy. And I've had some preliminary conversations with attorney Sharin Everett at KP Law, who is kind of the real estate expert for KP, and we've worked with her for years. And and you know there, we have some other more pressing things that we're working on with with her. But I think when Paul um, is ready, we will certainly engage. You know, when we're ready, we'll engage um, Sharin. Um, in in looking at this policy with a fresh set of eyes, now that um, you know we are um, uh, um, under a, a different form of government and, and a small city, so I think all of that is is spot on. Um, the committee really has not met. We have certainly had our hands full um, doing a lot of the pre work and the assessment work, as I said, of. Um, you know, of, you know, we took ownership of, of Hickory Ridge. We are doing and have done some significant work on the property on Strong Street, Old Farm Road, um, uh, the Old Farm Road property. Um, so part of this committee work is to do some of that due diligence because a committee really can't make any decisions just from looking at the GIS or looking at a property map or a survey. You really need to know what is the zoning, uh, you know, do you really, does the town really own what it thinks it owns? What are some of the environmental constraints, topographic constraints, water, sewer, all those factors? So I guess the short answer is the planning staff and I have done a lot of the background work on these properties. Um, so informally, I guess you could say we've met, we've had numerous, numerous meetings on Strong Street. We've done wetlands, we've done rare species work there. Um, we have uh, looked uh, extensively, as I said, at the wetlands and Old Farm Road, um, but um, and we've done some preliminary work on the South Amherst campus. So we've met, I guess you could say we've met, but um, we have not taken those properties any further than that at this point. Um, so I, again, I think it's a good time to, you know, take a close look at the policy and then see where we go from there. Thank you, Kathy. So, Andy, you covered my initial comments that it clearly, the, the every time it says one entity, we need to be changing it. So, I looked at when when you get to the committee, um, there's a list of people, and one of the positions doesn't exist. Um, at least, it doesn't exist right now, and that's the economic developer position. So. I have a question about the group as we're in the context of looking forward um, to what we potentially face over the next three or four years, which you listed them, Dave, some major properties, um, you know, rather than uh, some smaller properties. But but I also think, you know, the South Street School that when we talked about maybe using that as a temporary headquarters for Emirates meeting, it turns out it needed too much money to be put into it to be used that way. I think we, if we're not going to use it, we should be thinking of what are we gonna do with it? So my question is, this is a policy document. Would we talk, focus potentially on who, is, who are members of this group? For example, put one person from finance on it, from the finance committee um, and if you have this as the group that's in general, would you create an, an active group, a different kind of group when you have a particular property in mind that's in action? And the one I'm familiar of only because I'm reading the Gazette, <clears throat> East Hampton clustered several together and had some particular development ideas and went through, do we go this way? Do we go that way? There was a lot of public involvement and then they came up with what they, potentially one to do and could RFP it. And I think I saw it up in Deerfield too. So at the point a property was actually active, it wasn't just a committee of staff, it was a, a larger committee. So I have a question of, we, do we think of that in this context or is that something that becomes an adjunct to your group? And my final question is, you just noted that you've gathered a lot of information on some of these properties. Do you then have a file, a document? So if we wanted to say, tell me more about Strong Street, tell me more about, so is each of these kind of an internal memo that says, 
you know, we really only have a quarter of an acre here because of wetlands, or we've got more than we thought, but there's X, Y, or Z, or is that, um, you know, in multiple people's file cabinets? So that's my last question, you know, as you go along and you're, as I said, kind of, you're meeting, but you're not meeting per se to dispose of it, you're meeting to just take a look at the property and have enough knowledge. So I will stop with that. Um, uh, and it is a question of, should there be more written into this or do we wait and say that's an ad, more of an ad hoc group we bring together and we would do it when the timing is right? Well, I would, I would defer to Paul on some of the questions about, you know, uh, composition and all of that. My, I guess my only thought would be, Kathy, and if I think I heard you right, it, it almost sounded like having two layers, maybe two groups. And that, my initial thought is, wow, uh, just, I, I just can't imagine working with two groups on, on, on kind of surplus policy. But, but again, I think um, I'll, I'll defer to Paul on that. I think a smaller, you know, a smaller nimble group that then does its work, you know, uh, all of the due diligence work behind the scenes, makes a recommendation and that recommendation is supported by you know by studies and and surveys and whatnot to a larger body um you know that's kind of i think the direction we were headed way back when when this this was all started i will answer your quick question so almost everything we do now is electronic so yes we do have electronic files, if you will, on, on these properties, some more than others, if there were wetlands done, if there were surveys done, if there were, um, you know, other, other studies done, yes. So that, that is all part of the due diligence of, of putting together uh, a packet for each of the properties we own. Okay, just, Paul, I want to let you talk, but I didn't really mean two layers. I meant when we have a larger decision to make, that it's not just waiting for the staff group to come up with ideas, but mm. it, 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 there's a way to get input on, on it before Absolutely. the ideas come. So instead of, oh, but there are two other things. And so it, it, it wouldn't have to be in this policy document. So I'm looking at... Sure. And, and, and obviously, you know, an acre and a half of a old farm road versus the Wildwood School, two completely different scales of properties here. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I was going to add to the, say similar things is that when we have, you know, the fire station or Wildwood School, that's a different scale. That's a major policy decision by the council, ultimately, because you're the ones who can dispose of property. Um, so I, I think this is a group that's really doing the grunt work in advance of that. When it comes up to what are we going to do with Wildwood School, that's going to that's going to have to have a standalone active group, or however the council wants would help. Whatever, however we can assemble the information for the council to make an informed decision, and whatever path that is. Okay, and and Paul, just the other question I had is: we don't have an economic developer. Would you ever think of? a person from finance being on it, or is it better to just have it in an, an internal staff? I mean, it, it it was created as all, everyone listed was a staff person um, since. Yeah, yeah well, we can certainly consider that. I mean, it, it would, economic development was, was a purposeful addition. It wasn't just a finance person. It was about sure. economic development. So, you know, maybe someday we can get the economic development person back. Um, <laughs> So um, we can think about what, what what's the best way to handle that 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 skill set that we want at the table. Okay, thank you, Bernie. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, I, I I think Dave's observation that we don't have that much real property um, that we may consider using or disposing of is a good one. Like many towns in New England, we haven't made those kinds of strategic investments in open space for something other than conservation. I mean, we don't have a development plan per se. And, you know, we'll, we'll bump up against that over and over and over again. This may give us a chance to have a development plan. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, the first part of the, the, the policy here, uh, conforms completely, I, as far as I can see, to the uh, Inspector General's 30B manual, which hasn't, which was written two years before the policy. 
and hasn't changed since then. And so that $35,000 figure still holds, even though that's kind of silly with land values the way they are now. Uh, my suggestion would be um, this will convert fairly easily to city form. Uh, chapter 40, uh, section four does talk about C and D uh, cities and uh, uh, making changes appropriate to the charter. So that's, you know, and I, I'm sure that Siren, who's a very competent attorney, can uh, set us on, on a straight path for, for that very quickly. Um, my, my suggestion would be simplify, simplify. Uh, we don't need to have a cast of thousands doing this review. We should have a, a smaller, nimble committee that meets regularly, even if it is just to review their previous work. I think if you have a committee that sits out there and doesn't meet at all, um, it becomes sort of a mystery and, and people lose interest. So, uh, uh, you know, having a, having a small, nimble committee that can review this stuff um, and flag when it becomes a larger policy issue like Wildwood School. Um, so that's, um, <clears throat> those are, those are my suggestions. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, um, so my question is about on page three, number five um, and six. So when we think about current and, or sorry, when we think about, yeah, current and foreseeable use of a property, I'm, I'm curious what bounds are placed on that. So would a, rec and I know I'm speaking in hypotheticals, but might a recommendation say, this property could be used for X, but the zoning would have to change. This property could be used for Y, but this, like, I'm, I'm thinking about what recently happened in Holyoke, where there was a, um, you know, a, a commitment from a buyer of what they were going to do with a property once they changed the zoning. Uh, the zoning was changed, the buyer then is turning around and selling the property to, to someone to do something totally different with. And so I'm curious, what are the Kind of what are the bounds placed on those recommendations when you are examining current or when you're examining really future use? Um, and can we maybe possibly create something that would be consistently applied? Some sort of, you know, looking at these four different things, either like based on the zoning, this is what's possible. If zoning were to change, this is, it's a rabbit hole. And so I'm not quite sure where to cut it off. But um, I think it, Something that's important is that this is a consistent formula that whatever committee is looking at this is applying uh, when they are when they're considering future uses of property. And this also is a really great place to make sure that we've got that equity lens that we talk about and the climate lens that we talk about um, yeah. consistently applied. That's that's one of the key spots. I'd love to see those really specifically um, uh, placed in there. Could I respond to that quickly, Andy? Sure. No, thank you, Anna. That, no, it's really, really good point and and a good reminder as we as we kind of blow the dust off this and 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 revamp it for for the form of government we currently have. I think I think those lenses that you talked about are are really good ones to 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 apply to this and and really, I mean, you know, when, as you were talking, I was thinking of so what are our purposes for surplusing? What what does any municipality when they when they are analyzing, assessing these properties, what are their goals with regard to um, these properties? Are they trying to activate them for residential use? Are they trying to create more affordable housing? Are they, uh, is the town um, trying to generate revenue, get them back on the tax rolls because they're currently not paying taxes? And all of those need to be considerations. Um, and, and to your point or your question, I guess about Consistency, yes, I think we we need to we need to look at all of those consistently. I will say that each of these properties is going to be unique in its own way, um, and whether it's zoning, whether it's topography, whether it's water and sewer, whether it's wetlands, um, how buildable are these properties? Do they have buildings on them? What are buildings we look at? Um, the South Amherst campus is a great example. We look at that as wow, this this wonderful, beautiful old. Uh, um, a school building with a 1950s, 1960s addition to the South, which maybe isn't quite so beautiful. But a developer, I will tell you, does not look at that building as an asset. 
they look at that as a liability. And, and you know, we've worked very creatively and, and effectively, I think, with Wayfinders and, and that project for the East Street School, that building will be re reused for four to six units. And that's wonderful. But um, it's not a slam dunk. It's not that's not an easy ask sometimes. And so we, we also have to be realistic, I think, in what what are our goals? What are we trying to achieve in these properties? Um, we we would we would love it if somebody offered us millions of dollars for some of these properties. But the reality is that that's probably not going to happen, that a developer might the promise might be I'll get this property on the tax rolls for you and you will be able to tax this use this building for X. Um, we also need to put the municipal lens on and say, do we have needs as you outlined? Are there other needs in the community that have yet to be achieved that we might want to reserve this property uh, to help us uh, achieve goal A or B or C? Um, mm -hmm. and, and as you said, looking at through the equity lens as well as the sustainability lens makes perfect sense. So I think that's that's all good. And, and I think it's a great time to do that. Um, Thanks, Dave. I think it's, yeah, I think just expanding a list of those questions to mm -hmm. address all the things you just mentioned. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think this is a very excellent conversation, and it's the first time, except to talk about an inventory of property, that the this form of government has ever talked about property. Um, and so, um, this was one of the things that I actually had a pretty high priority on as we went into fi financial guidelines. So that I'm going to just step back and say, what's our next step? And I think our next step is to get this policy revised so that it reflects our form of government and then also get into some of the details within the policy. It does seem to me, maybe I'm wrong, but this has to become a policy of the town council that then is used as we look at these various properties we're talking about. Now, Paul, you may disagree with that. And I, you know, we I we should talk about that now, whether or not this is because, as you know, we all know, um, you shared the um, executive with the select board. And the town meeting was the legislative branch. We kind of cleaned that up a little bit with the um, this form of government by not having the select board kind of sitting in that middle situation. So my bottom line is, what's the next step to get this policy shaped? And then what's the process to get it adopted or put in place and then how do we apply it and where? Those are, I'm sorry. I can't raise my hand, so that's okay. I was just gonna recommend next steps. Uh, I think Lynn, you're right. The conversation has been really good so far. Um, I think Dave, you probably have enough to take a first pass at updating the policy um, to reflect the comments here, make sure it's consistent with the law and then bring it back to this committee um, to, to review an updated version of the policy. And, and then, I'll, just, I'll respond to that too. So I think you're right, Lynn, on all your points. Um, I think the care and custody of the land is the responsibility of the executive. The disposition of land, if we're gonna sell something is the responsibility of the legislative branch, which is a council. Um, right now, this is an executive policy that we're looking at. I think taking, just as Sean said, having a first cut at that, getting that back, welcome your comments on that and then go from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That helps me clarify because um, I, it's hopefully by midnight on May 2nd, this will become an even more important policy. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. Bernie, you have something more? Please. Yeah. Um, I, I, the, the part of the policy, there's two pieces of the policy that I think are going to need focus. One is the uh, who who is who the final authority is for disposition of the property. Uh, the statute speaks to the ability of the town uh, the town manager to contract, and um, so Sharon can opine on whether that means um, the manager gets the final say as to what property is disposed of, 
or this, the city council, which is also a, an option for under different types of charters. Uh, the body of the policy is consistent with what exists now in chapter 30, um, 30B, um, section 16, I believe. So you really don't have to worry about you know, the inspector general hasn't changed anything and uh, the legislature hasn't changed anything in the intervening time period. I think what you really need to focus is what is the town, what, what's the town doing? Who's, who's, the, who's going to be on the committee? Uh, how does the information get compiled and how does that get communicated? Um, that's, you could probably just incorporate um, the IG's manual by reference and take care of the first three paragraphs of the of the policy. So that's um, that's what I'll be looking for is, is how are we going to implement it here as opposed to what the statutory obligations are. Mm -hmm. Andy, oh, yeah. could I jump? Go ahead, Dave. No, no, this has been very helpful. So I think, you know, I'll work closely with Paul and Sean on, on kind of next steps as, as uh, outlined here today. Um, I, yeah, I did just want to maybe end to, uh, Bernie, you mentioned a couple of things a minute ago that kind of prompted, you know, just, just some thinking from me and, and, and I think this is very exciting to kind of look at this policy now, given some of the demands we have on our, on our, on our capital budget and, and our operating budgets and how can we translate some of these properties that we have into, um, their assets now, but how can they be activated in a way that either, you know, perhaps they are sold and we realize that revenue and put those into other other um, uh, uses that we have and, and priorities. Um, perhaps they are brought back on the tax rolls through creative other measures. Um, I think we've been pretty strategic. So I think our track record is good. I was just jotting down, Bernie, as, as you were talking, I was thinking about Paul will think I'm a broken record on this, but um, that that wonderful gas station we brought up in North Amherst, uh, when many people kind of said, "Wow, why did we, you know, why did we buy that gas station?" But I I still believe that we will we we will make a new intersection there and make traffic flow much safer and more effective, and we have a wonderful uh, new addition to the North Amherst Library that wouldn't have been possible without that strategic uh, purchase of that gas station. Likewise, on Belchertown Road, when we bought the land on Belchertown Road, we we packaged that with the East Street School, and either neither one of them alone would have provided the density for wayfinders to jump in with us and partner on affordable housing and market rate housing mm -hmm. there. But our hope is to get 70 units, and then of course Hickory Ridge and and the strategic pur purchase of the VFW site. So I think we need to apply some of those same principles and due diligence to, to look at all of these sites as Anna indicated with, with these different lenses and say, okay, um, you know, what is it, what's in our crystal ball of needs moving, you know, next five years, 10 years, 25 mm -hmm. years, and, and then say, okay, how do we either dispose of this property in a, in a responsible way for the following, you know, to achieve these goals, or do we hold on to that property because we know we have needs that this property will, will uh, fit. So, I think it's an exciting mm -hmm. time to kind of uh, take a fresh look at this. Yeah, and and all those efforts are appreciated, Dave. I, I uh, uh, don't mean to. Uh, oh no, no, I didn't take it that way. We haven't been no. active in it. No, um, just... But it's not. It's it's atypical for a town in New England to say set aside property for industrial development or set aside, um, uh, you know, buy property because it may we may need to use it in the future and larger chunks of it. You've been and, and Paul's been very strategic in terms of, of, of picking our spots here and uh, all for all for good purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be nice to see if we could exercise uh, some of the strategic vision to, uh, to to produce some economic development as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these all these projects have had, had real benefit to the town, not denying that uh, it would be nice to see if we can uh, uh, now um, realize some some economic growth and economic uh, and some some tax dollars from um strategic purposes absolutely so are we talking about really a little bit more than just real property disposition is is this really a real property management 
policy we're looking towards? No, I, I think, I mean, my opinion is this is about disposition. That's the question that was raised and we want to focus this policy. There might be a sub subsequent policy, but at this moment, this is about what properties do we want to dispose of? Um, that's how I look at it, Andy. Okay, I just wanted to make, get it out there to make sure that we were all together uh -huh. on that and make, see if there was any but you had a different vision of it. It was what the policy was when developed and uh, is outdated and needs to be brought up to date. And that's what we're, our specific referral was. So um, I think that at this point, uh, is if you're beginning to work on it a little bit on our behalf, okay, that's greatly appreciated. I think through Sean, um, you can keep us informed as to when um, it should next come back for another round on the agenda. Um, it might be interesting for, I just for, I would probably do it just because I'm always curious to do these things is to look at some other cities and see what they have, in, if anything. My suspicion is, is that it may be harder to find a, a good policy than you think because I wonder, how many cities really have policies, but at least you could find it might be worth doing some fishing. Anybody else who wants to do that, or if you want to do that too, um, be. Yeah, we, we definitely will. And if anybody finds anything interesting, by all means, send it, send it my way or Sean's way. And uh, we did do that back when we developed this in 2018. And it was pretty spotty as to what we found out there. Um, there was not any great examples to really draw from, but perhaps in the in the ensuing years, there's there's been some some development of those policies. But we'll certainly do some do some searching and outreach to other other cities and towns. See what they've. Yeah, done. I remember. I think I remember kind of a little bit of that observation when it came to the select board. But it's been long enough that my memory doesn't really work all that well. Um, Okay, so anything else that people want to raise on this? Um, otherwise, I think we can get on to um, sort of what our work plan process is going to be for the next months and um, also in scheduling meetings. And that's pretty much what we have left. And uh, the uh, what, what was on. Um, last night on the on the milestone schedule for the schools the finance committee was mentioned multiple times in that document february 7th is noted being uh the first time it comes up for discuss and recommend action on debt exclusion then um february 28th was um further discussion of debt authorization um March 21st was discuss and recommend action on debt authorization. Um, and then um, with, with going back to the town council um, in each step of the way. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that, Sean, or fill it out in any way or. Um, no, I think those are the main things. Um, uh, I don't think that you, you mentioned CPA earlier about weaving CPA into it as well and how that'll fit into the school vote as well. So I think those are the major things. And to fill out what we said last night and what we were talking about is, is that uh, we usually do a, get a presentation on um, the recommendations of the CPA committee, but we don't always take all of the uh, CPA recommendations as a single block vote. We may, but if there is a reason, like with the library, there was uh, to have it at a separate date, or if there's a grant process that requires that it that there be a deadline date, and the grant uh, is driving it, we will also do that. Yeah. I think one other thing, Andy, quickly, um, uh, if there, if anyone does it. If anybody does have questions on the debt exclusion, 
you know, we're working on uh, the information we're going to present. If you want to send those questions into Andy and I, um, we can make sure to get those answered. I know Bob, you did a good job. You sent some along that we'll make sure that we address. Um, if anybody else has any questions, they know they're going to have now. Feel free to send them along, and we'll make sure to address them. Okay, Lynn. I assume that MSBA will be fairly prescriptive about the language for both debt exclusion and debt authorization. Yeah, they have templates on their website. Right. Um, I believe I know for the debt authorization, I believe for both they have templates on their website. And it does seem to me that um, I, I know, Kathy, you stressed this last night and I agree with you. Uh, we want to um, give the nod if we're going to about the uh, CPA money that's related to the elementary school. So we probably should go ahead and see if we can schedule the CPA um, committee for the 7th, February 7th as well. And so, the, and if we need another meeting, as Kathy has already suggested, do February 14th so that it can come back to the council or it's a late February meeting, which I think is the 20th. That sounds about right. Uh, so we could do CPA by then. Um, the debt language, um, the debt exclusion language, again, being pretty prescribed, I think the main thing that the committee may need to do is uh, understand what all of these things are since this is the first time the town has done it and I think it's important that the finance committee be seen as knowledgeable about the language and what each of those things are and so I think when we start, when we start next week uh, or whenever it is um that we would want to make sure that we do a little bit of a primer on those issues as well. So I may, is it possible for us to do the February 7th for CPA and also that a big lift? Yeah, that's, that seems a lot for one meeting. Well, the yeah. other option is we go ahead and schedule the 14th and that gives us, we can do the CPA on the 14th and then that gives us the opportunity to bring it back to the council for the 20th. Yeah. Um, so the other thing is I look at the uh, list that we put together of uh, in its in, in a, item six um, mentions Community Preservation Act, which we've discussed, regional school budget, operating budget, and the capital improvement plan. Uh, we have a template that we've worked out pretty well for the operating budget and the capital improvement plan that they really flow after uh, the beginning of May when uh, calls required to provide the budget to the committee, uh, to the council and the committee. So, um, of course, and the other thing that we do know we try and handle during April is regional school budget. Mm -hmm. And we, I think we all know um, that the uh, four town meeting is coming up, which will give us a lot of uh, context and information for that discussion when it comes up, because it usually by then getting a fairly good idea of what it what it is. Um, so those are the items that come up. Uh, we have generally been under an agreement that we're going to try and meet on the day after on the Tuesday after council meetings and um, I want to make sure that that still is okay and it's not and what's um, coming forward is we need an additional date the next council meeting is February 6th which should make the, which is where the February 7th date comes from uh, the next council meeting after that according to the schedule is February 27, which makes February 28th the next meeting. And so we that is a long uh, period. And it seems like there's a feeling that we need to get one additional meeting in there. And uh, so the question is, is it better to do it on the, 
on the school holiday week or not do it on the school holiday week. And uh, uh, we don't have to necessarily make the decision now, but I certainly, if not, we'll have to send out a poll to ask for um, indications of preference on that because uh, it may affect the work schedule and uh, availability of members of the committee. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Kathy, I see your hand up. Uh, yeah, so um, I just want to make sure I'm clear on what we're saying. I think we need a meeting on the 14th, which is the 6th and the 14th. And the 14th is not the school vacation week. And, and so my thinking, Lynn, is on CPA, and Sean, you can correct me. I don't think there are too many controversial items on the list. Um, you know, sometimes something was pulled off under, do we really want to do that? So I'm not sure how long it will take, um, but there's some, there was some interesting ways we made the two big housing uh, proposals, projects work, um, and Sean can explain that. But Lynn, if, if we had that and we had enough time to make sure we all understand what debt exclusion is, you know, look at the language, we send questions in, then what I think I would like what I'm proposing is the 14th, and I don't care what the mix is. I want to look at the town share and talk about what, how much of that needs to be a debt exclusion and, um, and talk about uh, some of the pieces. Margaret started to feature them and have a discussion without a decision on it, but just a discussion of it. Um, on the 14th. So that would be in the context of already understanding what a debt exclusion is. Um, so that just would be my thinking. So it, that isn't the vacation week. That's the uh, Tuesday before the vacation week. So I don't know, Andy, if you were saying another meeting on the 21st, but we would be otherwise meeting on the 28th. So if we met on the 7th, the 14th, and then again on the 28th. No, what I was really trying to get at was it's the 7th, it, it would either be the 14th or the 21st. I didn't know if there was people who had a preference for the 21st for some reason. And um, so I was really- Okay, and, for, and so I, I just want to say the other thing last night for those of you, I think everyone here was listening. Um, I'm, I'm going to get Margaret to confirm it, but we send this large document into MSBA. It's due by March the beginning of March, March 1st, 2nd, and well before April 26th, there is a meeting between our designer and answer on the formula, um, you know, so it won't be, we won't get the official reading on April, until April 26th, but we will get a good reading on, on the math that you saw last night, um, and I, I'm just going to confirm that, so that that's the going in hypothesis, um, that we would be looking at in these finance. You know, we're not going to have anything more, whether it's the 21st or the 14th. So I would just like to make sure um, we raise any questions. We get, you know, get Sean to explain all of this to us. Um, and what we can and can't do would be great on the financing. So, I mean, my preference is the 14th, but I don't really care. I don't have any conflict on the 14th or the 21st. I, it's fine with me. And I will stop there. Okay. Anna? I do have a conflict on the 14th. I would not be able to join that day. I would be able to join on the 21st. I apologize. And Matt? Thanks, Andy. I could do either one of those days. 21st is fine. Um, I wanted to ask, Kathy, did you have a, a rough date for that ballpark meeting that you just described? Or a time frame? I'm sure there's not a date, but a time frame. Matt, I'm going to ask them again. We have we have a forum tomorrow morning, so I was trying not to interfere. So I'll ask Margaret loosely last night, say mid March to late March. You know, so I'm just going to. One of the issues is the actual entity MSBA has, in our experience over the last year, and it's not just our experience. They are more short staffed than they used to be, so they're not as quick on some things. Um, so um, I will, you know, I'll get, I'll get my reading on them on, we know what the due date is for the larger report. 
<laughs> Got it. Okay. Mid to late, Mark. Thank you. Um, yeah. Hold on. Um, I, I want to make sure we check in with Alicia, who is not only has children, but teaches. So um, whether or not that school vacation week is kind of put aside uh, for her. Alicia. Um, thank you, Lynn. So I, I am actually available on both dates. Uh, my only question that I have is what time, uh, because it actually works better for me when we meet at three as opposed to 3.30, because during the school days, I am also teaching after school, which starts at four. So when we start at 3.30, typically I cannot, like I can only join for 30 minutes. It works better for me if we start at three. Okay, no, that's helpful that you said that. Uh, Would it work better for you, Alicia, if we started at two? I could do two thirty, but um, I'll still be teaching at two. I'll be finished at two thirty, so I could do two thirty or three, um, and then I would have just a hard cut off at four. But both of those dates, I'm available. Do you have a preference for two thirty, and should we be polling the committee to see if? 2.30 is an acceptable time or not? I think whichever works best for everybody else. Um, I would be okay if a majority of people couldn't come for 2.30 and could be there for three, I'd be okay with doing three. Um, but I think I just prefer whatever a majority of, of other people can do. And do you wanna just ask for a show of hands, like this kind of hand, can anyone not make 2.30? Um, I guess would be, and Anna's got her hand up. I'm really cutting into my work day already. I really can't push it sooner. I'm sorry. Okay. It's, yeah. So three is more, pre is it preferable? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sounds like we're three o'clock is what therefore is coming out unless I'm looking to see if there are other hands of people who have comments. John? Um, I just want to clarify, are, are we inviting uh, the CPA chair of the CPA committee to a particular meeting that we agree on the 21st for that? No. Um, I think I was oh, suggesting I this. Yeah. Lynn, you go ahead. I, I would suggest that we start the conversation about the schools on the 7th so that if we have any additional questions that we could clear, clean them up on the 14th, and that we focus strictly on CPA on the 14th. Well, actually it's the 21st now. No, the 21st. Yeah, the 14th didn't work for Anna. Oh, that's right, the 21st. And, and then that allows us to bring both back to the council on the 27th. Okay, so C, so CPA 21st, I, I, just, I can, if everyone's good with that, I can, I'll reach out to the chair and make sure that works for, um, for him. Thank you. Okay. And and let me just also say, as we have done in the past, given that Alicia really is only with us from three to four, that we make sure that we pack as much into that time that we'd like to make sure she gets to weigh in on. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I've done in the past and uh, I'm going to try and get back to is... Uh, when we have a general list of topics, if there's any items that are particularly um, important to Alicia and she wants us to schedule first, I want to, I've tried to at least uh, consider that as carefully as I can um, in order to honor uh, her participation and her wishes, because I know that it's been hard for her and I appreciate that she's stuck with us and is sticking with us again. Uh, so with that, I don't, um, and I, I think the other thing I'm just gonna mention is, is uh, if there's anybody who can help out with uh, doing, who's willing to take on one or two sets of minutes, don't have to volunteer now, just send me an email because I wanna really get cleaned up on the minutes, I'm finding that it is taking a little bit of time for each meeting. Um, I actually do have 
two that I probably could have pushed for today, but I um, decided to just hold um, hold back. I think the one that I'm absolutely ready on, and I think that I have a have completed all of the edits, and they were nothing major. Um, is October fourth, and we're very close on May nineteenth because. That was when the um, Kathy's looked at too, because she chaired that meeting. It was one that I had to um, be absent for a substantial portion of. The only problem is you didn't list those on the agenda for today. Everything's listed on the agenda. They're all they're all they're, oh, they're all sorry. listed on the agenda. Actually, absolutely right. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong agenda. So we could take a motion to. Um, approve those two but the others uh need review and i'm sure that we're getting getting more drafts from it from uh athena and the which which dates are those october uh, may 19th and october 4th of a and b are the first two i'm willing to make a motion that we approve those two second and motion made and seconded and uh None of them. Uh, the changes are uh, not substantive. They're all um, editorial, you know, types of things, but not substantive changes from the draft that has been floating for some time. Um, so I, I'll go through, do a quick vote on that, um, and uh, then um, I think we're ready to adjourn. Uh, unless there's other business I have done. I don't know if anybody else has unanticipated business that they want to bring up. Uh, so um, we usually do it alphabetically by last name. Um, and Anna, if you want to abstain, it's absolutely understand, but it starts with you. I do abstain. Thank you. Okay. Lynn? Approve. Uh, Bob? Support. <clears throat> Matt? Support. Bernie? <clears throat> Support. Um, Kathy? Yes. I'll vote yes. And Alicia? Yeah. Okay, so we have uh, of the voting members, four yes, one abstain and support from the three um, resident members of the committee. Does anybody else have unanticipated business I have none to bring forward at this point? Seeing none, then I declare the uh, meeting adjourned for today and uh, appreciate it. We did a lot of uh, work to get going. And um, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.